friends, the Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to Second Church on this cold, snowy, finally winter Sunday morning. Happy New Year to all of you. Um, a couple announcements this morning. Uh, first, if uh, you saw the uh, email that went out this week, um, the Pinewood Derby is being moved to March 16. Um, because nothing can get in the way of a Calvin Hope basketball game. <laughs> it's fine, I'll let that go. <laughs> um, and because of January series and just having things set up, we uh, thought it would be best to just move it. That also gives you plenty of time to build a car. I know there are still some left, so if you are interested in that, talk to Rob or to Glenn. You have lots of time now to be creative and design an award-winning car. So that will be the middle of March. Other things that are coming up are the evening Thursday evening Love in Action classes. Uh, this happened this fall. Uh, we have a cooking class and the Empower You Finance class, uh, and they're using our space for those. And uh, they are also asking for child care. Um, this fall we had one family that had a, uh, a child that needed care during those classes. Coming up so far, we have seven kids um, who will be here. Uh, those families, of course, want to be able to come to the classes but need childcare, and so that's a wonderful gift that we can offer them. So that is Thursdays at 6, right? 6, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and so we are looking for at least four volunteers uh, to be in the nursery for two different age groups. So if that is something you are interested in, I invite you to find Steve Marotti and let him know that. That runs for, I think, 10 or 12 weeks. And even if you can just do some of them, uh, please let them know so that we can put together a schedule. Um, next week, we're having communion, and I'm being selfish about this and wanting to serve you communion one last time. So we're doing it differently. We are going to invite people to come forward, and I'm just gonna tell you how we're doing this now so you can start thinking because there's going to be a bunch of different options to make sure everyone is comfortable. So I will have bread that will be spaced out. There will be the little cups of juice. You can either come up, take the bread, eat, drink your little cup, put it back in, go down. You can come up, take both, go to your seat, eat it there. Um, you can come up and there will be the little elements if you really love those and you can take those back to your seat. You can also stay in your seat um, and someone will bring it to you if you don't want to come forward. Lots of different options in terms of keeping masks on and off and being where you are. So I just want to kind of get that in your mind now just so you know what to expect, that next Sunday there will be communion. We will be coming forward. You can also just come forward and receive a blessing, um, but we're looking forward to that. And then this morning, uh, we're doing our roll call, kind of looking at the past year in the prayers of the people. Um, and as always, we try really hard to make sure that we remember all of the things and include all of the people that should be included. But of course, we are only human, and so if we uh, have missed someone, we do apologize up front. Um, uh, let us know, and we can send something out in the bulletin next week. Um, Time is a weird thing during COVID, too. It's hard to remember what happened this year versus last year versus like a week ago. Um, so again, just if we have forgotten anyone or anything, we apologize up front. All right, that is everything. So I invite you to rise in body or in spirit. And to hear these words of greeting from the God who calls us into this place this morning. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance. From God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. As God has greeted us, I invite you to turn in your pew to wave to one another and pass the peace of Christ to one another. This morning we are starting off with a song that may or may not be familiar to you, 
Uh, it's called Jesus, Jesus, Oh, What a Wonderful Child. It's kind of swingy, it's kind of fun, it's kind of peppy, so I invite you just to, we're going to sing through it three times. It's short and easy, um, so you can listen to it the first time through and join in, or simply join in when you feel like you've got it.
please join us in this call to worship. People of God, arise, shine, for your light has come. The light of Christ has come into the world. Emmanuel, God with us. So arise, shine, for your light has come. We will follow the light when it leads down familiar paths to expected destinations. When the road is unfamiliar and the star rests above a dubious looking home, we will lift up our eyes and look around. And when we see the Christ child, may our hearts be overwhelmed with joy. When we are in the presence of Emmanuel, may our knees bend in worship. When our journey brings us finally As we wait for the dawning of Christ's light in the new creation, he is God with us, Emmanuel. In the moments of our lives that bring us joy and gladness and in the moments that bring us sadness and pain. On all the roads we travel in life, those filled with suffering or with sunshine, God is among us, going before, behind, below, and beside us. And so as we look back over this year and all that has happened in our congregation, we bring all of that, our whole lives, before God. Would you pray with us? Lord God, as we end 
this year of our Lord 2021. We gather in prayer to give you praise for your presence and care in our lives as a church community during the year that has passed. We remember those who have left our presence, called home to be with you. Lee Hammond, Bonnie Veldblum, Ruth Poole, Don Weesies, John Wanders, and Ellen Walters. Jesus, our Good Shepherd, be comfort and peace to all who mourn. May they feel your nearness always. We remember those who experienced significant health challenges this year. Les DeVries, Jim and Jean Skeitman, Joyce Ruloffs, Gord Vierink, and Owen Wolfus. Emmanuel, God with us, bring your healing presence to all who are sick, worried, or hurting. We celebrate our members who have been blessed with a long life of 90 or more years. Evie Baker, Doris Bolins, Cena Bowl, Betty Bosma, Conrad Branson, Gladdy Brooks, Joyce Dark, Hank DeYoung, Vic Nyenheis, and Lee Vontem. Mighty God and Father, thank, thank you for, for those whose presence and wisdom of the ages blesses our, our lives. We give thanks for the babies born or baptized this year. Madison Steginga, Everly Hassevort, Owen Wolfus, Theo Nockenhauer, and Isabella Farrar. Jesus, Jesus Messiah, thank, thank you for the, the gift of new life, life and, and bless the parents as they raise their children to know and love you. We give thanks for the profession of faith made this year by Brianna Zydema, Aliyah Zydema, Samantha Farrar, and Chris Farrar. Wonderful Counselor and Everlasting Father, we praise you for the testimonies of faith made by your servants and pray for your continued presence in their lives. We give thanks for new members in our church who add to the rich and wonderful tapestry that makes up our congregation, including this year Alan and Cindy Van Dyke. Lord of Lords and King of Kings, thank you for your blessings upon Second Church and on the church worldwide, a diverse and beautiful community of your people. We give thanks to God who is faithful and keeps his covenant from generation to generation. As we reflect back on this year and anticipate a new year, we do so in the confident hope that God's mercies are new every morning and that he will continue to walk with us and be our God through whatever the next year holds. Light, Light of the, the world, world, shine on our path as we enter 2022. May your grace, love, peace, hope, and joy surround us each and every day. Amen.
As we reflect on God's faithfulness to us and we look ahead to the new year, let us together profess our faith, profess what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed, saying together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And at this time, I would invite any kids with us ages five through second grade to follow Miss Emily out for walk out worship. and gracious God, we thank you for your word, your word that nourishes and sustains us, that comforts and that challenges us. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive your word, not mine, not ours, but yours, for you alone are God. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Colossians chapter 3 verses 12 through 17. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. 
bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. One of the things that happens when you move is the inevitable purging of the closet. Clothes that I've been hanging on to for a long time, thinking maybe I'll wear this again someday, no longer make the cut when the new question is, do I want to pack this? My wardrobe has been pared down considerably in the last few weeks as I think through how much space I'll have in the truck or how much space I'll have in an apartment where I won't be able to simply designate one of the four upstairs bedrooms to be my closet, (laughs) which has been a perk of the last four years. But William, uh, who also just moved to a new city and started a new job this week, William and I have also talked about how moving somewhere new feels like a chance to reinvent yourself. And a big way that we do that is through the clothes we wear. I've had outfits left over from college or from seminary, and those clothes simply don't fit who I am anymore. We all experience this as we enter new phases of life, we gravitate towards different wardrobe styles, and moving somewhere new gives an opportunity to try things out, to experiment, to do something a little different without the people around you saying, wow, that's an unusual look for you. Putting on new clothes or different clothes is a way of stepping into a different reality, of conforming to something or attempting to be something. Right? We know the common adage, dress for the job you want. Look the part when you go to the interview so people will believe that you are who they need, that you will fit in, that you will rise to the occasion. When I started training for a half marathon last spring, the first thing I did before stretching or downloading a training app or going for a run was to buy new running clothes so I could look the part, so I could believe that I could be, that perhaps I was, a runner. It almost worked. (laughs) Colossians 3, 12 to 17 is a text about putting on new clothes, changing up the wardrobe. And we could read it like a checklist, a wardrobe requirement to ensure that we get the job, that we make the grade with God, that we can convince him through our outfit that we are good enough, that we fit in. Hat of compassion, check. Shoes of kindness, most of the time. Shirt of humility, well, that doesn't come off the hanger quite as much as I would like. If Colossians 3 is in fact a checklist, a wardrobe recommendation so we can prove to ourselves and to others and to God that we can handle this job called Christianity, not one of us is going to do very well in that interview but hopefully you know where this is going. Colossians 3 is not, in fact, a checklist. It isn't an if-this-then-that scenario. It's a description, a because-of-that, now-this. Right at the start, right at the very beginning of this wardrobe description is this phrase, therefore, as God's chosen people holy and dearly loved. God's people all have the same rather extraordinary starting point. We get up in the morning and these three things are true. We are chosen by God, we are holy, and we are loved. 
And so right off the bat, this isn't about fitting in or making the grade or earning the job. This is not about proving that we belong, that we are good enough. This is not about keeping up appearances or pretending to be something that we're not. The interview has already happened. We belong. From before we were born, we have been chosen by God to be part of the body, part of this family. We don't need to prove anything. And we've already been made holy. Not because we were compassionate or kind or humble. We have been made holy because Christ is holy. And as Isaiah 61 foretold, Christ has clothed us with the garments of salvation, the robes of righteousness. And finally, we are dearly loved, which is what we want most of all, right? To belong is one thing, to fit in is one thing, but to be loved, to be cherished, to feel like we are valued, like our presence would be missed, like we will always be accepted even when we do something foolish, that is what we yearn for all day long. And Paul tells us that we are loved. Loved and cherished by the one who made us, the one who knows each hair on our head, who knows even our worst thoughts, who weeps over us and smiles over us and watches over us as we sleep. There is nothing that can separate us from that love. This is where all of us start from. This is our reality. This is our identity. And so when we gather as the body of Christ and we look around at one another, at this eclectic group of people we call church, we are not defined by our clothes or our preferences. We are not the person who wears shorts in January, the person who really likes organ music, the person who always attends adult ed, the person who never empties their mailbox, the person who always takes two cookies, the person on all of the committees. These are not the things that define us. We are holy, we are chosen, we are loved. This is at the very core of who each of us is. But now notice, I've said a couple times that this is our starting point. This is our truth when we wake up in the morning. What the Israelite people so often got wrong was their belief that they could stay there, that chosen meant superior, that chosen meant that everything was good, that they could rest on their laurels. They were already in, so nothing really mattered. Being chosen and loved is the starting point. It is our identity. But the trick now is to live into that identity. And that is easier said than done. Because our desire to be loved, to belong, to be included, to be liked, runs so deep within us. And our fear that we are none of these things is far too present which drives us to feel like we need to prove ourselves, to constantly rise to the occasion, to dress well for the interview. But if we wake up in the morning in fear and anxiety, it's much more difficult to actually clothe ourselves according to our identity in Christ. Ironically, desperately wanting to earn God's love and each other's love can lead us to put on a hat not of compassion but of rigidity and shoes not of kindness but of judgment and a shirt not of humility but self-righteousness. And our outfit becomes all about me proving myself, looking good, looking the part for my sake. The challenge in Colossians 3 is to believe, to fully comprehend, to know deep down inside that you are loved. To let that sink in and then to live accordingly. 
Because someone who is loved, who doesn't need to prove herself, who is comfortable in her own skin, has the capacity to think outside of herself. Someone who knows he belongs can make sure that others belong too. He can show compassion to the down and out. She can be kind, genuinely caring about the feelings of others. They can be humble, serving one another without caring if they're noticed or not. He can be gentle, making space for the other. She can be patient, not quick to snap back or condemn, but willing to sit with someone for the long haul. And they can forgive. They can acknowledge that they too are none of these things all of the time. And so when they're hurt, they can extend the hand of forgiveness, the hand of sameness. And binding all of these things together, perfecting each one of these virtues, is love. Love because God first loved us. When we start when we know our identity as children of God, chosen, holy, and dearly loved, when that is such a core part of our being, known deep down inside our souls, we will inevitably be dressed in these garments. We will display the fruit of the Spirit. It's no accident that this text is placed in the lectionary for the Sunday around New Year's. Because all around the world, people will be making resolutions for how to become their best selves in 2022. They'll make plans to go to the gym, to eat better, to be more social, to go on more adventures, to practice more self-care. All in an effort to change, to be better, to be more acceptable to themselves and to others. But for the Christian, perhaps our New Year's resolution should simply be to become more of who we already are, who we truly are, to live into the identity that already exists, to be most fully ourselves, chosen, holy, loved. And the the somewhat ironic or paradoxical thing about this is that our individual transformation happens in community, and that the community is shaped and transformed by who we are as individuals. Because we become more comfortable, more secure in our identity as God's children, the more we hear about what it means to be God's children, the more that we are reminded that this is the case. And so it is vitally important that we sit with God's word, that we allow the message of Christ, the message of peace, the message of hope, that we are chosen, holy, and loved to wash over us again and again and again, that it plants itself deep within us. And it is important that we do this together. I know that with COVID, there are really good reasons to stay home to watch the live stream, to be safe. I also know how easy it is to fall out of rhythms and practices, and that there is a certain level of convenience to staying at home. And so if you find yourself staying at home on a Sunday morning because it's easier, because you don't have to deal with other people, because it's quite nice to watch the service or maybe even just the sermon in your PJs whenever you want, cup of coffee in hand, allow me to gently challenge that. Because while the church never closed when we went fully virtual, Fundamentally, the church is an ecclesia, a meeting in the Greek, a gathering. We are the body of Christ together in community. We are shaped and formed, encouraged to live more and more into our identity as we live with and learn with and worship with one another. Because here's how this section that we read today ends. This is how the NIV translates it. Teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. 
through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. We're not just formed through good teaching. We can't just listen to podcasts or sermons. Our identity is in part shaped by our worship together. We often think of the word admonish as a disciplinary term. But here, I think it means to make each other fully understand and realize the message of Christ, this idea of identity. And do so through your songs, through your worship, through your togetherness. At the heart of our corporate worship is not, did we do enough band or organ songs, or how long was the prayer of the people today, or gee, that was a really interesting outfit that person wore. At the heart of our worship is the question, did you hear the message of Christ? Did you encounter God today? Do you leave here knowing that you are chosen, you are holy, you are loved? Today, more than ever before, we can go church hopping to our heart's content. We can attend a church online, or we can visit different churches in person based on what style we're in the mood for today. And that's not all bad. There's a lot of beauty in being able to expand our ideas of what church looks like, to worship with the broader body, to experience the diversity of the body. But if that's all we're doing, if we skim along from one place to another, but we don't really dig in, we aren't really rooted somewhere in one community, we miss out, I think, on an opportunity to answer God's invitation to live into our identity. The invitation to be shaped by the knowledge that we belong, that we are holy, that we are loved. Because all of that formation happens in the mess that is church. When we gather as a group of people who don't all agree, who don't all think alike, who like different worship styles and have different opinions on what church should look like, who have different opinions even on what a Christian looks like, that is where we experience grace. That is where we receive compassion and kindness and humility and where we are given the opportunity to practice compassion and kindness and humility. That is where we come face to face so profoundly with the truth that what binds us together is love. When I describe Second CRC to other people, I tell them that this is a church that loves well, that you care for one another. And I think it's because of that love and the grace of God that we have weathered COVID and political tensions and mostly weathered worship squabbles rather well. And I hope that continues to be the way you describe this church. That the love of God that binds you together continues to be what you hold on to. Because as we get more and more weary of COVID, as we deal with the trauma of the last two years that will arise and surface in unexpected ways, as you search for a new pastor, as you rely more heavily on lay leadership, as worship maybe looks a little different for a while, there are going to be a lot of moments when tensions could rise, when compassion and kindness and humility are harder to come by, when it might just seem easier to check out for a while. But the church, second church, is itself, not because of a pastor or a worship style or when things happen a certain way. The church is the church because it loves, because it is loved by God. So when people ask you, what is your church like? I hope the answer is always, we love one another. We love each other by counting money, by making coffee, by preparing meals for funerals, by baking cookies, by teaching Sunday school, by stocking books, by attending meetings, by shoveling steps. We love each other through our disagreements. 
We love each other when things are going well. We love each other when things feel a little more tenuous. We love each other dressed in compassion and kindness and humility. And I hope that as the church, as this church continues to put on that wardrobe, those around you wouldn't say, my, what an unusual look for you. But instead would say, of course, that is what the church looks like. That's what Jesus looks like. I hope the world looks at the church, whatever church, wherever the church is, and sees the light of Christ. Would you pray with me? And so, Lord God, shine through us. Bind us together in love so that everything we do, all our words and our actions, our very deepest thoughts even, might be shaped by your love. Give your church patience and grace, compassion and kindness, fortitude and strength, so that whatever the future looks like, it may be met in hope by a community bound together, proclaiming unfailing trust in you. In this epiphany season, shine the light of your presence upon us. And may our love reflect your light. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. of the God who loves you. May God go before you to guide you. May God go behind you to protect you. May God go beneath you to support you and beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid, but may the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit settle in among you and remain with you always. Do not be afraid, but go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And all God's children said,